Yo, what up, everybody? My name is Drake Demore from the Wind City Sports Podcast, and this episode of Cedric Ben's Combat Quarter is brought to you by the Wind City Sports Podcast. Check us out on Spotify, iTunes, and anywhere podcasts are found on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or directly on windcitysports.com. Smell you later. Yo, what up, what up, what up? Welcome back to Cedric's Combat Corner number 23. I am your host, Cedric Ben. Today on the Triple C's podcast, I'll be going over the big rematch from last Saturday, Deontay the Bronze Bomber Wilder versus Luis King Kong Ortiz. Yeah. So I'll start off with a, with a brief breakdown of the actual fight. Then I'll give my individual analysis on each fighter. And then uh, I'll finish off with my educated opinion on what each fighter could do to improve um, going into their next match. And of course, finishing off with the, the BTF, the boxing training focus of the week. This one will be uh, shoulder mobility part two. Yeah. All right, all right, let's get into it. Starting first with the challenger, Luis King Kong Ortiz. This guy, to give you a little brief uh, description on him. Six foot four, 236 pounds, 78 inch reach. He comes with a, in with, with a record of 31 and two. Well, those two losses only came to Wilder. Um, I like to look into these guys' amateur careers too to see how far they went because that's uh, sometimes not always a description of how you're going to do in the pros, but it uh, it, it does help. Um, Ortiz comes from the Cuban school of boxing where they are pure boxers. Um, just to let you know, in Cuba, their standards for boxing is like how Canada is with hockey, just to let you know. Um, he won a gold medal at the 2005 Pan Am Games, silver at the World Cup, and uh, he made it to the quarterfinals at the World Championship. Deontay Wilder comes in at six foot seven, only 219 pounds. A little quick side note, um, Deontay Wilder, Deontay Wilder's out opponents outweigh him by an average of 30 to 40 pounds, just, just to let you know. At least 30, and he's taking care of all of them. Anyways, 6'7", 219, 83-inch reach. He comes in at a record of 42-0 and, oh and one draw. His amateur career, um, I couldn't find the exact number, but I know he did not have a, a long amateur career as far as number of fights. But he did manage to win a bronze medal at the Olympics, with, which is amazing because I know he didn't have similar to like George Foreman. He only had like, you know, I think probably about 15, 16 amateur fights, maybe a little bit more, but it wasn't much more than that. And for him to, to, to win a bronze medal at the Olympics shows you that power is not something that he just developed over time. That, that came naturally. <laughs> yeah. Okay, something that I mentioned before, you know, one of the reasons why uh, my podcast specifically comes out later on during the week, you know, the fight might be on Saturday, and I don't, I don't put my show out until like, you know, Wednesday or Thursday of the next week. The reason for that is because I, I like to listen to other shows to, to not to steal their talking points. I come up with my own stuff. I like to listen to other shows, boxing shows, to, to hear where people's opinions are at and the reasoning for that. And then instead of calling their show and only having three minutes to talk, I come on my show and talk as long as I want. So one thing I'm really disagreeing with is um, people that are trying to discredit uh, this win by Wilder by saying that Ortiz is, uh, is, was too old just because he's 40 years old. Now, in most cases, not, not in most, in some cases, that would be too old. It all depends how much, how much you take care of your body. In this case, I definitely don't think it was, there was any, any signs of, uh, that you can say that. Because I don't care if he was 40 or 45 or 55. He still shows the, the skills of a boxer that can be in a competitive match with any of the top guys. Okay, your his age, the, the, your age has nothing. Is only if your age is only a factor if you show signs that it's a factor. Like if you're over the age of 35, like you know, in in just regular real life, if you're 35 years old, that's not old. But in athletes' terms, 
that is definitely getting up there in age, especially to be able to compete at the at the top level. Um, you know, if, in boxing specifically, if you're over the age of 35, and and then you know you start losing fights to to guys that everyone believes that if you fought them early in your career, then you would have beat them easily. That's a sign that you're sticking around too long, and you should retire to avoid any some serious brain damage. Luis Ortiz is a Cuban boxer. Them guys, they don't get into wars. Even the heavyweights, they're pure boxers, which means Ortiz's body is not worn down. You can't, you can't say he took too many punches. He's only been KO'd twice, and both by Wilder. The rest of his career, he's, he's won. Um, and, and just in general, heavyweights last longer, can last longer, because they don't always rely on their athleticism. You know, George Foreman came back at 45 years old. So I don't want to hear all that, oh, you know, he knocked out a 40-year-old guy, whatever. I don't, again, I don't care if he's 40, 45, or 55. Just like I said before, he's still displaying the skills of a boxer that can still be in a competitive match with any of the top guys, any of those guys. If you took a minute to do some, uh, some extra research, to look up some of the oldest champions in, in boxing history. Here's a few names that you might remember. Bernard Hopkins in 2013, well, sorry, in 2011 he became, he broke, he broke the record at 46 years old. And then and in 2013 at 48 years old, <laughs> he won um, a WC belt, WBC belt, 48 years old. Next up on the list was George Foreman, um, who came back at 45 years old. And this was probably about a 10-year a, a ten, a ten retirement that he had. Ten years in between his last big fight, and he decided, he decided to come back. And at 45 years old, 1994, he came out and uh, regained the heavyweight championship. After that, you got Roberto Duran at 38 years old won a belt. Evander Holyfield, one of my favorites of all time, at 38 years old, won a championship belt. The greatest of all time, many, many consider him to be the best, Muhammad Ali, at 36 years old, beat Leon Spinks for, uh, for a championship belt. And just on a quick side note, I'm going to make a, 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 um, another podcast specifically about this but for everyone I apologize this is a little bit off topic but for everyone that that says that Canelo was too young or wasn't ready when he fought Mayweather Floyd was 36 years old when he fought Canelo all right 36 years old so you obviously know that wasn't in his prime 36 years old all right, well, that's, we'll save that for another, for another day. So those are your oldest champions there. My whole point of bringing that up was to say Ortiz is 40 years old. Don't think that's too old as long as you're keeping yourself in shape. That's the other thing. It's what you're doing in between fights. If, you know, somebody, if you're only fighting three times a year and in between fights you're gaining you know, 20, 30 pounds and you're not eating properly and you're drinking alcohol every weekend, your, your body deteriorates a lot faster. But some fighters, you know, I, some fighters don't let themselves get over like 10 pounds of their fighting weight, fit 10, 15 pounds. That way your training camp just consists of working on your skills, not just losing weight. So, yeah, much respect for Luis Ortiz for still being competitive at that age. Now, moving on to the bronze bomber. This guy probably has the best quote in all of sports right now because it's, it's not just something that's funny, but it's actually 100% true. His quote is, when these guys fight me, they have to be perfect for 12 rounds. I only have to be perfect for two seconds. <laughs> and that is 100% true. Now, here's the thing, like for, you know, some people might might try to say that, you know, he just got lucky because I I'm a Wilder fan. I'll tell you right away. I had him losing every single round. I hear some people say they, you know, they, they gave him one or two rounds. I I am a Wilder fan 
and I had him losing every single round. Clearly. Clearly. So uh, <laughs> the other thing that I, that I disagree with that I've been hearing for, for the people that are trying to say he just got lucky with one lucky punch, you might be able to, to say that if it happened, you know, maybe two or three times in his career. But you can't really say it's lucky if it's luck if he did it 41 out of 43 matches. <laughs> 41 out of 43 opponents felt what Ortiz felt on Saturday night. And even the two, the two that went the distance hit the canvas. Bermain Stavern and, and Tyson Fury both hit the canvas hard, were hurt badly in, their, in those matches. And it's, and it's almost the same story every time. He's either losing, he's either losing the fight or, or he's in a, or the, the fight is very close, like back and forth. I don't think there's been a, a match yet where, well, obviously early in his career, but where, where you know, he was out boxing the person. It was, it's always close, you know, back and forth, back and forth. The, his opponents us, usually look more technically sound than him. And then, you know, at some point in time, boom, that right hand is coming across your jaw. And it is simply good night. I, I don't care, man. I'm not just living in the moment. He has to be, he has to be at least considered one of the most devastating boxers of all time. Whenever, like when when people make them random YouTube videos of you know the hardest punches or best punches of all time, they they better be adding Deontay Wilder to that list. Um, especially when it comes to one punch, one punch KOs. It's one thing to to be good and catch something with catch somebody with something hard. And, and they're not able to defend themselves, and then you just jump in for the kill with a flurry of punches. But just to catch somebody, bam, with one shot, and it's all over, and then, and then you walk away like, a, like one of those walk-off home runs, <laughs> that, uh, that's, that's a, different, a different type of power. So I took a second to um, do some research just to see the hardest punchers in the heavyweight division. And here is your list. Starting, well, th these aren't in order. I, took, I just took the ones from the most recent times that uh, most people now would recognize. Starting first with Iron Mike Tyson, whose career record was 50 wins and six losses. He had a 76% knockout percentage. 76% of his opponents did not go the distance. Next up, we got big George Foreman, who finished his career with 76 wins and five losses. He had an 84% knockout rating. After that, we had Vladimir Klitschko, who finished his career at 64 wins and five losses with an 87% KO rating. And then we take it back to Rocky Marciano, whose KO percentage was 88%. And then we have number one of all time, Deontay Wilder, who has a 95% knockout rating. If you fight this guy, there is a 95% chance you are going to sleep. Now how, listen man, you can make fun of me all you want. Like, honestly, like, if, if I was a heavyweight boxer, I was going to say if you're a heavyweight boxer out there, you should really consider it. I'll put it on myself. If I was a heavyweight boxer right now on the come up, if I was already in the mix, like if I'm already at that level, you know, we got to bang. But if I'm, if I'm just one of those up-and-coming boxers, like just starting off my, my pro career, man, I ain't trying to fight this guy right now or anytime soon. Like, he, like... 95%. Just think of all the work that you have to put in. You know, it, it's, it's hard for people to imagine, um, you know, the, the, the work that fighters have to put in. But just try to imagine <laughs> you putting in all that work. If you're training hard, you got a, whatever, 8 to 10 week training camp. Even if you're not in training camp, you should be just in the gym at least a couple times a week just maintaining. Um, but you get ready for a training camp, you know, getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, going for a couple miles run. Come home, eat breakfast, not just whatever you want, because you still got to make weight. So you got to eat properly uh, and then rest if you can rest. <laughs> if you're on a come up, you probably still working full time. So you got to go to work 
at lunchtime, you got an hour, hopefully your, your, your boss is cool enough to give you an extra half an hour, you can um, you know, work out, quick shower, and then get back to work. And then at nighttime, at nighttime, what do you think you're doing? Going home to your family? No, no, no. You're back to the gym for sparring and whatever tech, other technical stuff that, uh, that you got to do. So you go through all that for like eight to ten weeks, and then what? Boom, this guy just comes in and with one punch, <laughs> all that is done. You know, it's one thing, you know, if you're in a, in, a, in a boxing match, you know, you might, obviously you work on your defense, but if you do get caught, you know, you're, you're hopefully the punch just deflects or, you know, even if you get caught flush, you can, you, that's what being in shape helps with too, is being able to recover. But man, this guy, he just has that extra gear, that extra gear of power. So yeah, all right. So now my uh, quick little um, analysis on what I think uh, each fighter can improve on for their next match. Ortiz, uh, basically just see, staying focused. It's not like a drill that you can practice, but just just making sure you stay focused. The reason why I say that is because after the fifth and sixth round, you can tell he was feeling good. He knew he was winning. He's a solid. He was dropping his dropping his lead hand, uh, and he was talking. He was talking a lot of shit to Wilder. Um, yeah, you could tell he was feeling comfortable. He was boxing. He was out boxing Wilder, and just doing his thing. And then he just simply got caught slipping. He thought. I'm assuming he he thought he was just gonna coast his way to a 12 round unanimous decision, because that's the way the fight was going. Again, I had I had him winning clearly. Even though I was going for Wilder, I couldn't find, you know, even if I couldn't really find any rounds to give to Wilder. So he was clearly winning, but yeah, man, he just got, he was feeling too comfortable. Dropped that left, that right hand, his lead hand a little too much. And, um, and got caught slipping. As I mentioned before, if you get caught slipping versus Wilder, there is a 95% chance that you are not getting up from that. He got up, but he was not ready to go. He was definitely not not ready to go. And again, I honestly believe Ortiz. This guy, this guy's been ranked since 2015, and while there's only fight, the only the only one that gave him a shot. There's a reason for that. <laughs> He's a very good southpaw. He would be in a competitive match. Again, don't listen to to these people trying to say he's too old. He's still doing his thing. He still has his skills. He's not he's not worn down. I honestly believe he would be in a competitive match with any of the top guys. Well, and again, just think about this, okay? He did. He, he has two losses. He did get stopped. Even though he did get stopped in the two losses, he just went had two, two, two fights, about 16 rounds, two competitive matches against the hardest puncher in the sport today. The first fight, a lot of people thought he was winning. The second fight, I clearly thought he was winning. And so, yeah, man, you know, he's, yeah, he, he, he's better than the competition that the other guys are fighting right now. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Now for Mr. Wilder, he has the best one-two in the game. I say one-two, I mean jab and cross. Not, not I don't mean his jab alone because his jab still needs, not that it needs work because I, I know he uses his jab more. He just needs to use it more, and I'm sure it's it's not a it's not a question of him knowing how to throw it because, you know, I I know his coach. His coach is is Mark Breland, who's one of the greatest amateurs of all time, won a gold medal at the '84 Olympics. Um, you know, very good amateur boxer, one of the best ever. So I know, and he was tall and long and really knew how to use his jab. So I know, I know he's he's showing the Wilder how to use it. Just that Wilder just has to have more confidence in using it more, right? He'd be able to keep these guys so much off of him so much easier if he used that jab. Um, you know, in his interview, he said he, they asked him if he, um, if he gets frustrated or, or um, not panic like you're scared, but, you know, get kind of worried later on in, in, the, in, the, in the match when he knows he's down. If he has to, if he feels that he's desperate and has to really go for the KO, and 
and he said he never really worries about that because he, he knows at some point in time that right hand the, he's, is going to connect and it will be problems. So just keep on working on it. Just try to incorporate it more, not work on it because, I, again, I know his coach is making him work on it. So he just, just himself has to have more confidence, confidence in it and just uh, use it more. And there's the educated breakdown on that. Now, what is next? So we have set up, supposed to be February 22nd, Deontay Wilder versus Tyson Fury, the rematch. Um, however, I'm just kind of concerned with, um, with Tyson Fury's commitment right now. This guy, he's doing, right now he looks like he's doing the same thing he did after he had the big Klitschko win. He had the, this guy had the biggest win of his career. Never defended the belt once, got stripped of his title, and then disappeared for like two years and ended up in rehab. Um, I'm not, oh, I hope that doesn't happen again, but right now he's, he's not really showing the signs of someone that's focused on, on you know, being at the top. I don't know. It just seems like he, you know, so the, so the, the match, the rematch is supposed to be in February. You'd think he'd be focused. You know, this guy is doing... WWE, he's on wrestling Monday Night Raw. Um, he's, you know, I see him do a video doing training for MMA with that Darren Till guy. I don't know. I, I just question how focused he is on his career right now. And I'm hoping he's not going to lose and have a million excuses after. Now, I said this to someone. Someone brought up a good point. They said, you know, what is he supposed to do? He's at the height of his popularity, so he's just trying to take advantage of that, which is what you're supposed to do. You are supposed to take advantage of every, you know, financial opportunity that you have. The only problem with that is that if you're spending too much time on that, it means you're not spending enough time on your training, which is what got you into that position in the first place, which was which was what happens to a lot of fighters. You know, they're hungry coming up. They're hungry coming up. They don't have nothing, and they make it to the top, and then uh, all of a sudden they're not hungry. They're not training as hard, and then... Um, upsets happen that's how upsets happen all right so hopefully he stays focused and uh, that rematch happens february 22nd now in two weeks in two weeks we have another big rematch with uh andy ruiz and anthony joshua um i have more a more detailed analysis on that one on the official Triple C's uh, show in two weeks. But my initial prediction is uh, I, you know, I have a feeling that Andy Ruiz is going to pull off the upset again. That's my initial prediction, and I'll give my details about that two weeks from now. And then after that, we have Tony Harrison and Charlo 2, another big rematch. If you didn't get a chance to check out the press conference, it's pretty heated, man. It's pretty heated. It's, it's always a good match when um, when the two guys legit don't like each other. <laughs> and so that's what we got in this one here. So there you have it. The BTF tr Boxing Training Focus of the Week. Shoulder Mobility Part 2. Check out the YouTube page um, for the Part 2 of the Shoulder Mobility using the lacrosse ball. All right, very important for um, just for your career longevity, keeping those shoulders nice and loose, injury free. So check that out, shoulder mobility part two with the lacrosse ball. All right, there you have it. Cedric Combat Corner number 23. Thank you very much for listening to the Triple C's podcast and uh, stay tuned. Shout out to Win City Sports, peace. <laughs>